or vascular control is difficult. Most of these patients who are critically injured would be considered poor surgical candidates in certain conditions, and transcatheter therapy can actually limit parenchymal loss when compared to the options that um, they may have for a surgical treatment. Trauma uh, can be from blunt penetrating or iatrogenic origins. You can treat patients on presentation, after they've been to the OR, or when uh, delayed complications occur. You can treat stable and unstable patients because resuscitative efforts can con continue in the interventional radiology suite. Um, anatomic site. Liver, uh, spleen, and kidney are particularly um, benefited by transcatheter um, methods. You can also treat retroperitoneal injuries, hollow viscous, pelvis, very suited to transcatheter treatment. And upper or lower extremity, head and neck, pulmonary vessels, pretty much anywhere. Um, you're going to uh, usually get a CT scan in a patient who's stable. Uh, the abdomen and pelvis for sure and the chest is needed. If you see a injured artery and there's active um, extravasation identified, then the patient can come over to the angiography suite at that point. If the patient's unstable, Depending on where the suspected injury is, they may need to go up for an operative exploration, or if it's uh, suspected to be pelvic in origin, they can come for an emergency angiogram. Time is really critical because um, in order to uh, limit the amount of blood loss, you need to uh, stop the bleeding as quickly as possible. And one of the things that is um, really critical in these patients is to uh, make sure that they don't get cold. Hypothermia causes a coagulopathy. That's why anesthesiologists keep patients super, super hot. So the coagulopathy that these patients get is a combination of the transfusions that they've received and being hypothermic. So that's why we keep a bear hugger um, patient warming unit in the angio lab. Um, it's really fantastic for trauma patients, and we use it a lot for um, any sort of pediatric patient, keep the peds patients warm, and also for doing extremity work, because if you have nice vasodilated vessels, then the detail is more clearly seen. So this is just a little tip for something that you can keep in around that's really helpful. Um, so when you're doing the diagnostic portion of the angiogram, you're going to start non-selectively. That's going to identify a massive bleed. And once you've kind of gotten an idea of where you most suspect the bleeding's from, then you can be more selective or subselective. The selective and subselective angiograms are much more sensitive and are going to detect a smaller uh, amount of bleeding than the non-selective angiography would. Um, lots of agents are available, but for trauma, really, it's going to be either gel foam or coils. And we actually use liquid agents not uncommonly for treating uh, trauma. You can also use stents and covered stents, but those we're really not going to cover today. So when you're doing an embolization, these are the things that you have to keep in mind. You need to uh, consider the expendability of the injured artery, the type, the site, and the number of injuries. You have to consider your agent and how quickly it could be delivered. You need to think about how precisely you need to place uh, your occlusive agent. You need to consider the duration of the occlusive effect that you want. You have to think about the collateral circulation, and you also have to think about standard and variant arterial anatomy. Gel foam is 
something that you can deliver quickly. You can treat multiple injuries all at once. It can treat an extensive collateral network, and it's in cases where you don't need to worry about being precise with your placement, like the pelvis. Coils and microcoils are what you're going to choose when you really want to um, precisely place your embolic agent. You want a permanent um, agent. If there's a single expendable vessel that's injured, you can limit parenchymal loss by being very precise with a microcoil. There's all kinds of specialty coils now that are available, detachable coils or hydrocoils. And also, um, amplats or plugs can be useful for a proximal splenic embolization. The specialty coils that are out there, they're pretty expensive, so you want to consider also um, the cost of the agents, too, and how badly you need the specialty coils before you would choose one. They come in a lot of variety of sizes and shapes, so just keep a bunch on your shelf, and then you'll have what you need when uh, the occasion arises. And there's a couple implants or plugs that are available now. There's the kind that go, the Amplats or two goes through a bigger size sheet. And then there's the new one, this uh, Amplats or four that actually goes through a regular five French diagnostic catheter. Um, they're uh, self-expanding and they're good for larger vessel occlusion. And um, they're really uh, fairly nice for proximal splenic embolization. Okay, so uh, here's the first case we're going to talk about. It's a 25-year-old male. He was in a motorcycle collision. He went up to the OR. He's had a, a left nephrectomy and a splenectomy. He's unstable and has ongoing hemorrhage that they're having trouble controlling. So how would you approach this? Are you guys going to respond or am I going to just continue? Tell me. Probably best that uh, you continue. It's, uh, okay. Difficult. No problem. Okay. I'm so used to teaching it that it's weird to be in a, a place where I'm not looking at people. Okay. So <laughs> you're going to start non-selectively. You're going to identify major bleeds. Um, and in this case, you do the aortogram and you see two areas where there's pretty brisk hemorrhage, one up in the upper abdomen and one in the lower abdomen near the pelvis. So start with a pelvic injection, inject the internal iliac on the left, and um, you see the bleed, but it looks like more than one branch is contributing to this. So uh, routine scatter embolization with gel foam was done. But you have to remember to interrogate potential collaterals. So L4 was examined, and there's the bleed again. It's really shaped similarly to what we saw on the internal iliac angio. So have to embolize the collaterals as well, as well. And that upper abdomen selected L1, secluded, but you're not done because you have to consider the collaterals. Go to L2, and you can see the bleed is collecting distal to where L1 um, artery was occluded. So just because you see a vessel occlusion, that doesn't mean you're done. You really need to make sure you examine all the collateral vessels, particularly true in the pelvis, the um, chest wall, and the abdominal wall. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some specific organ injuries. Um, hepatic injuries. They used to do routine laparotomy for that, but it was non-therapeutic two-thirds of the time. And to do an operation and not actually find an injury, very, very um, morbid. So now um, there's much more tendency to uh, try and treat patients 
non-operatively or um, with uh, angio and embolization. Really, the, the injury grade and the amount of hemoperitoneum isn't um, a reliable way to tell which patients need to um, come to angio. If they're unstable, they may need to go to the OR or to angio. If they're stable, they should go to CT. If you see the injury um, on CT or there's extra, then you can bring them over to the angiography suite. Because of the dual blood supply, the liver is an ideal organ for embolization, and you're going to use probably either gel foam or coils. There's about an 88% success rate, and the complications, which are usually an abscess, about 8% of the time. Okay. So here's a guy who had a gunshot wound a week earlier, and then he had a fairly abrupt drop in his hematocrit, 31 down to 15 and you see active extravasation into a really large uh, hematoma there. Here's a selective um, in angiogram of the uh, hepatic artery. You can see there's a big subcapsular component to this as well. And um, there's multiple sites of bleeding. There's active extravasation and an AV fistula uh, and gel foam you can treat multiple injuries pretty quickly. So gel foam slurry was used um, to uh, treat this and you can see there's no more filling of the AV fistula or extravasation into that hematoma. And this is where you feel like the instant hero because it's procedure probably took maybe 15 minutes and compare that to what it takes to actually do some sort of surgical treatment of this. It's a really, really um, fantastic way to manage this uh, and the morbidity is low and the success is high. So it's really an ideal spot to use uh, embolization. Okay, here's another case. This guy had a gunshot wound. He was brought down to the angio lab from the operating room because he was bleeding and they were having difficulty controlling it intraoperatively. You see on your um, abdominal aortogram, the right hepatic artery is occluded. So are you done? No. You really need to do uh, a selective injection, and with the selective injection, you see the brisk extravasation. That's what they were dealing with in the OR, and that's deep in the liver. That's not something that they're going to easily be able to access. So that's a major life-threatening hemorrhage and um, you need to treat that pretty quickly. And just in case you didn't notice, he has a um, completely replaced common hepatic artery to the SMA. So the um, right hepatic artery was selected. We actually did a little bit of gel foam slurry in case there would be some backfilling and then put some coils out there. And because it's a larger vessel, you can't just kind of plop gel foam in there and expect it to, to really um, treat this three to four millimeter vessel. You really have to use coils in that instance. Okay, here's another guy, also a gunshot wound. He'd been managed non-operatively for a few days, and then he had fevers and so he had a CT scan. And you see the, the pseudoaneurysm there, it's like a light bulb in the middle of that hematoma. We took him directly from the uh, CT scanner over to angio immediately afterwards. And this is the arteriogram you see. There's variant anatomy. There's a gastrohepatic trunk there. Um, you can see left gastric artery, and then that's the left hepatic coming over here, right hepatic. So 
you don't see the injury that you know is there like a light bulb, what do you do? So you try more selective. That's the first thing you do. So there's a, a selective um, AP. So you don't see it. You do another view. Don't see it. So another trick you can use is to use CO2 because CO2's low viscosity then shows the um, CO2 puddling in the um, pseudoaneurysm there. And uh, CO2 is something that you can also keep in mind when you uh, have a GI bleed and you're having trouble identifying the origin of a GI bleed. CO2 sometimes can help you identify it when conventional contrast injections aren't showing it. Another patient who got shot in the right upper quadrant and he is bleeding to death. This is massive extravasation, so it's not a case where you're going to try and be super subselective. Let me get, you know, two or three different branches and coil it. This is when you have the need for speed. You cannot treat this slowly. You really need to um, treat it very quickly. So um, in this case, just a gel foam slurry was used to um, treat the injury as quickly as possible instead of trying to be precise with coils. Okay, splenic um, injuries. Histor historically, um, with splenectomy that showed a 50 times increase in the um, post-splenectomy -splenect sepsis rate, especially with encapsulated bacteria. So pediatric surgeons trauma surgeons were actually the first to really try non-operative management, and um, they really tried to salvage the spleen in children. And they found that they could in about 95% of the children. Um, adult trauma surgeons were a little slower to adopt non-operative management, but eventually they did come around to non-operative management being the standard of care. And there's about an 80% success rate of non-operative management in adults. So uh, Sal Sclafani described a method of increasing the number of spleens that could be salvaged by doing a proximal coil embolization in the main splenic artery. And he would occasionally also do a more selective embolization of the um, bleeding branch. And they found that the embolization was successful in about 87 to 93% of the patients, and they were able to achieve a uh, 93 to 97% uh, splenic salvage rate in the non-operative group. Uh, only about 2 to about 7% required a delayed splenectomy. This is a patient who was in a uh, motor vehicle collision. He's got a subcapsular hematoma on CT, and they tried to manage him non-operatively. But his hematocrit continued to drop for a few days, so they requested an angio and an embolization. Uh, the proximal embolization technique was used. Ideally, you're trying to get the coils between the dorsal pancreatic artery and the pancreatic magna arteries. And the theory behind this is that you're going to reduce regional perfusion pressure while, while still allowing collateral circulation to preserve splenic function. Controversy still does seem to remain, and there's fairly high institutional variability. And what has not been completely determined is whether a proximal or selective embolization techniques are better, and exactly the um, indications for this. Should only stable patients be done? There's some literature 
from um, Japan that seems to indicate unstable patients would be appropriate for splenic artery embolization. Should you base your decision to um, embolize on CT findings? Should it be completely on the basis of hemodynamics? And some people use transfusion requirements as the decision whether to um, do a splenic embolization. There's really not good standardization. Um, there's several treatment algorithms out there. Um, one of the uh, newer articles that I've seen about this that I really like is this one from uh, May of last year from the Journal of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery. Um, Dan Saragusa, who I, is a member of the SIR, um, was a participant in this, and it was this article, Selective Angiographic Embolization of Blunt Splenic Traumatic Injuries in Adults, and it's a really good article. I recommend you guys look it up. And the other article that I recommend is um, the Effects of Splenic Artery Embolization on Non-Operative Management, a 16-year experience. These are two very good, um, fairly comprehensive articles with some good long-term follow-up. What both of these um, institutions have discovered is that, and they agree in their algorithms, that unstable patients need to be in the OR. Patients um, who are stable, who should get splenic artery embolization, are those who um, have evidence of extravasation or vascular injury, like a pseudoaneurysm on a CT scan. Anybody who has a grade four injury should also most likely go for a um, angio and embolization. People who um, have a dropping hemoglobin in the period of observation also can benefit from embolization. And stable patients with grade one or two injuries should be observed. There's some disagreement between these two articles whether patients with grade three injuries should be observed or should get an embolization. They, they don't quite agree on that, but I think for the most part, there's good evidence that um, splenic artery embolization is beneficial and in these clinical situations, does improve an institution's splenic artery salvage rate. Standardized treatment algorithms um, that incorporate splenic embolization will um, increase the splenic salvage for blunt trauma. Uh, the articles really don't differentiate between proximal and distal embolization techniques. Both seem to be effective. Complications were pretty minor for both groups. Usually, um, there's small infarcts, um, that's what was seen with the more distal embolizations, but it's usually in the area where the vessel is injured already, and recurrent um, or continued bleeding was also seen. And those patients then would um, either come back and have another attempt to uh, treat with embolization or go to the operating room. Okay, renal um, arteriography for trauma uh, should be done when there's persistent or recurrent macrohematuria. If there's active extravasation seen on CT, if there's a large retroperitoneal hematoma that's observed at surgery and they don't want to incise the retroperitoneum to explore it, um, it's really more common to do um, splenic or renal embolization for penetrating rather than blunt trauma because if the kidney is injured from blunt trauma, usually the force that's required to injure the kidney is such that it's a very high-grade injury and may not be appropriate for embolization. So this is a guy who got stabbed in the right flank. He had gross hematuria in the CT scan. That's his angiogram. There's a subtle lesion there in the lower pole. 
and it's just so beautiful because you can get out into that one branch with some micro coils. And this is a perfect result for getting hemostasis and essentially 95% of the kidney is still perfused. If um, this patient would have had an, oper an operation, it's very unlikely that they would have been able to salvage this much kidney. So um, you can see the advantages of uh, tra transcatheter treatment. Things you need to keep in mind when you're uh, choosing to embolize the kidney is that it's an end artery organ. You are going to get an infarct and that's why you want to be very um, precise with your uh, embolization agent. Microcoils are really uh, most appropriate for this. The success rate in the literature is anywhere from 82 to 100 percent and compared to the surgical options it's uh, renal sparing. I recommend that you do an initial abdominal aortogram before you try your selective renal angiogram because there's often accessory vessels and you don't want to uh, miss an injury that's off a small accessory renal. Okay, this patient um, has active extravasation seen here on a CT scan. It's out in the retroperitoneum, but it's not really clear uh, the source of the bleeding. Comes over to angio and you do the angiogram and you definitely see uh, active extravasation there, but the source of the bleeding isn't exactly clear. So do a right renal injection and you can see there's an adrenal hemorrhage. Pretty brisk actually, but it's from a tiny, tiny, tiny little branch. And this patient we chose to do a glue embolization. So the question is why would you use a liquid agent in this case? So it's a tiny little branch. The microcatheter is essentially occlusive in it. So if the vessel is stagnant, you can't really get the gel foam to deliver properly out into the peripheral part of the um, injury. If you just put a coil proximally, then you may allow bleeding from collateral flow. And glue penetrates like toothpaste. So you just um, inject it slowly so you see the forward progression of the um, glue cast until you see it out into the area of extravasation. And then you know you've gotten both the bleed and you kind of close the back door so you're not going to allow any collaterals out into the um, uh, area of the injury. So you don't want to close off the front door without thinking of collaterals that may also bleed. Here's a guy who's been to the OR obviously, had a small bowel repair, a left nephrectomy, but he continued to have um, bleeding postoperatively. You see a tiny little bleed out there, but you don't exactly know what it's from. Do a lower abdominal aortogram and you can see that it's actually from the IMA. Selective IMA and you see a pretty brisk bleed there. And get a microcatheter way out into that area of injury and just leave some coils very selectively. And coil placement is felt to be safe to the level of the um, basa recta. And to, to tell you the truth, it's not really that common that we would do a hollow viscous um, embolization for trauma. But if you extrapolate the data from non-trauma literature, 
using super selective techniques, you can get a um, 86 to 100 percent success rate in treating a um, arterial hemorrhage from the bowel. So hopefully this would at least stabilize the patient um, long enough, and if he would need to go to the OR at some point, um, he'd be in better condition hemodynamically to tolerate that. So you want to stop the hemorrhage as quickly as you can, watch him clinically. This is such a tiny area of embolization, I wouldn't really think it would um, cause any sort of ischemia in the bowel. but even if there would be a tiny area of ischemia that develops, you've stopped the hemorrhage. The patient can be um, resuscitated properly, and he could um, go to the operating room at a time when he's in better hemodynamic condition. Pelvic trauma is an area where um, interventional radiology techniques really are important because if you take the patient to the OR, you're working in a confined, confined space. It's really hard to identify um, a bleeding site. And once they incise the peritoneum, the tamponade effect is lost. Um, often what they offer surgically is a ligation of the internal iliac artery, and that's ineffective due to all the collateral circulation. So you're going to do um, pelvic embolization in patients who are hypotensive with um, pelvic fractures, who uh, have a decreasing hematocrit, who have a CT documented hematoma or active extravasation, or a patient who's been to the OR and has a um, pelvic hematoma that they observed surgically. You can do them either before or after the laparotomy, and we often do very unstable patients. Um, it can be from uh, either blunt penetrating and occasionally iatrogenic injuries. So this is an 82-year-old guy. He was riding a bike when he was hit, and you see active extravasation on the CT. Then we do the arteriogram, and you see early and late images, and it's kind of blah. You don't see too much. There's sort of a little stumpy thing there, but it's not very impressive, especially considering what the CT looked like. But because he's 82, we went ahead and did a gel foam embolization because 82-year-olds um, really they don't get second chances. So we have a very low threshold to empirically embolize an elderly patient. Um, during the angiogram, we did, during the procedure, we did a second angiogram to kind of assess our progress. And you see there's now massive extravasation. So this um, actually, and it's from exactly that spot that looks suspicious too. Um, so this really does teach several important lessons. Number one, arterial hemorrhage is intermittent, especially in the pelvis. You can have um, vasospasm, and initially you'll get the impression that there is no bleeding, but if a, a vessel opens up, then uh, once they're better resuscitated, they can have even increased bleeding. So. Arterial hemorrhage is intermittent. Also, elderly patients don't get second chances. So if you don't embolize them, you decide, oh, it looks pretty good, I'm not going to do anything right now, send the patient up to the ICU, and then something like this cuts loose. By the time you mobilize the patient back to the angio lab and try to um, treat them, then their coronary artery disease or their cerebrovascular disease can get them. So elderly patients really don't get second chances, and we have a very low threshold to treat them empirically. And third point is, if you're older than 80, stay off your bike. 
Okay. So this um, person got hit by a car, and you just see tons of different sites of bleeding. So for this type of um, patient, gel foam is ideal. You just do scatter embolization with a gel foam slurry, and you can get all these sites of injury treated simultaneously. So did the right side, did the left side, because you see several bleeds there too. But you have to remember variant anatomy. The obturator artery is a branch of the inferior epigastric in about 10 to 20% of patients, and it's the third most commonly injured branch in the pelvis. So if you didn't see it on your internal iliac runs, you need to look for it on, uh, off of the inferior epigastric. And that's a significant bleed. If you don't treat that, then um, the patient isn't going to do well. So you want to be sure and look for the obturator artery. We always start with a non-selective view. Don't go directly to the internal iliac artery because you don't always know what branch is going to be bleeding the most briskly. In this case, it's an old case, but it does teach an important lesson. It's the profunda femoris that's bleeding the most briskly. And if you would have wasted a lot of time treating the internal iliac arteries, that's a lot of hemorrhage to tolerate. So you need to do a global view. Um, Identify what you consider to be the uh, worst injury, treat that first, and then you can be more selective and look for other smaller bleeds. Um, so here's the technique. You want to do quickly do a non-selective view, look for sites that aren't that are bleeding that aren't the internal iliac arteries, then you're going to do bilateral internal iliac arteriography. Uh, sometimes you may want to even do a, a completion pelvic arteriogram if you think there's a chance that there may be collateral feeding an injury. And for critical patients or elderly patients, empiric embolization is indicated. Success rate about 90%. Complications are rare. It's uh, reported uh, impotence or rectal or bladder ischemia. Often the impotence can actually be attributed to um, nerve injuries, so the um, exact uh, cause of these uh, different uh, complications are not necessarily the embolization itself, but they might be from the initial injury. Okay, for extremity trauma, you need to assess the distal circulation before you embolize. Usually you're going to be using coils for precision. Um, the surgical option is usually ligation, so an embolization is less invasive. And for um, essential vessels, covered stents are an option that we have now for treatment. Uh, this kid got stabbed and he had persistent um, hemorrhage from his wound despite some poor med student being stuck holding pressure for a couple of hours. So you see the injury there of the profunda brachii. You get subselective with a microcatheter. Put some coils across there and it's kind of nice because you can see the coils past it, a little bit of coil ball out in the pseudoaneurysm and then coils proximal to it. And you want to do a um, long injection after you've done this to make sure that you've um, gotten both the back door and the front door occluded. So you can see here the static column proximal and the contrast coming back to but not going through the coil. Um, here's a what not to do. This guy had a uh, shotgun wound to his thigh and had an AV fistula that you see here. And what you cannot do in an AV fistula is just put a proximal coil in and expect that to treat the injury. 
here's a couple coils, here's the AV fistula. It looks like nothing was done to this. So what you really have to do in the case of an AV fistula, because of the pressure differential, there is a drive for the blood to go from the artery to the low pressure vein much less likely to spontaneously thrombose than a pseudoaneurysm where there's not a high pressure in that and there's no pres pressure differential. So for an AV fistula, what you really need to do is isolate the um, injury. You need to get a coil distal and proximal to the injury to isolate it so you don't get collateral flow through the fistula. This um, guy had a gunshot wound about two years prior to this angiogram. He has a pulsatile mass, and this is the arteriogram um, from the popliteal artery down. You see the big AV fistula off of the AT. But then, because the um, fistula is from a high pressure to a low pressure situation, it ends up looking similar to an AV malformation, and it um, recruits branches even off of the um, posterior tib tibial and perineal arteries. So you can't just jam a coil down here and expect this to be treated. It won't treat the AV fistula. So I tried to get through the AT directly to get distal to the injury, but couldn't really get distal from the um, anterior tibial artery. And it's a fairly complex um, network of vessels here that come to the distal AT. So you can't really treat this just with a proximal coil, so what do you do? So what we did was we actually stuck distally into the anterior tibial artery, practically at the dorsalis pedis, and put a um, catheter up the distal part of the anterior tibial to put the distal coil that we put from below and put proximal coils from the um, femoral artery access and isolated the AV fistula. So this is a post-embolization image that shows the coils on each side of the injury. There's no more fistula. And with um, proper coil placement, um, complications for extremity embolization are very rare. And um, success rate is somewhere between 85 to 100%. And in conclusion, embolization is safe and it's effective in trauma. You need to know and consider the surgical alternatives. You should know the anatomy, the variant anatomy, and collateral pathways. I recommend in our practice here is to begin with a global examination where you uh, can exclude um, all the areas that possibly may be injured and then you um, continue with more subselective catheterization of those vessels that are most likely to be injured. You have to balance the speed of sort of a scatter embolization with gel foam with the precision um, of a coil placement based on the lesion type and how quickly you feel like you need to treat the patient. You have to um, also balance the speed that you need to precisely treat an injury um, with the risk of the amount of parenchymal infarct that you may get. You shouldn't wait for a patient to stabilize to treat them because treating the hemorrhage is going to be the only way to stabilize these patients. So um, you can resuscitate a patient in the angio lab bring, you know, whatever blood products you need to support their clotting system and um, 
do all the resuscitation and transfusion protocol in the angio lab instead of waiting for them to stabilize because if they're getting massive transfusions and still bleeding, they're never going to stabilize. Although we didn't really talk about it, um, covered and uncovered stents increase the number and the type of injuries that we can treat. And this is an area where there are no turf battles. Uh, we're the trauma surgeon's best friends. And um, it's an area where interventional radiology is really a valuable colleague and uh, we have a lot to offer for um, patients who are injured. And that is the end. Do you guys have any questions? Thank you very much, Dr. Hanks. Uh, you are a couple very of questions. welcome. A couple of questions came up on the chat uh, while you were uh, speaking during the lecture, and I'd like to, to um, list some of them to you. Okay. Um, one of the questions came in the first case presentation uh, where you uh, had demonstrated the uh, Symbolization of those uh, lumbar arteries. In, in the, oh, okay. Uh, go and, ahead. Uh, Do you want me to go back to that? Um, sure, if you could. Sure. Great. My very first case. Yes. Okie doke. Okay. Could. What do you want to see? If you could take us through your decision process as to how you decided to use gel foam in this case as opposed to other agents such as the Google Onyx or... For the proximal injury or for the pelvic injury? For the, uh, for the particularly for the lumbar uh, branches that you um, embolized. Oh, up here? Okay. Yes. So, let's see. Oh, the lumbar branch here, this injury? Yes. I didn't show you the post here. Actually, we didn't gel foam this. This We put a little microcatheter out here, and it was a liquid agent that we used. I didn't show you my post. I'm sorry. So this one, we used a liquid agent and um, some fairly dilute glue and glue okay. this because gel foam, um, I think, probably wouldn't penetrate well enough. And we were able to get a microcatheter out to about here and send a little bit of glue out there. If so you, liquid you, agent was used here. We used gel foam down below. Let me show you this. We used gel foam here. Um, in the internal iliac, and then because we got way the heck out in L4, we were able to get a microcatheter out L4. We just gel foam that guy too. A follow-up question to that was: uh, yeah. Have you had any any complications while using uh, blue in uh, your various uh, trauma interventions? Nope. Nothing remarkable, no areas of ischemia, nothing that is um, out of the ordinary at all. It's actually um, increased the number of injuries that you can treat because you don't necessarily, and I find it really helpful in places like the intercostals, because the intercostals, if you don't get distal to an injury, and it's often iatrogenic injuries for intercostals, some chest tube bleed or something like that, if you can get a um, microcatheter securely out into an intercostal and then just gently push glue, you can get, or, or onyx, you can get it past the injury collecting in the pseudoaneurysm and then uh, plugging proximally. So I, I really find it's increased the number of branches that we can treat and haven't had 
uh, severe complications with it. Those are great practical uh, tips there. Uh, another another question was um, as far as your gel foam slurry goes, how mm -hmm. how do you prepare that, or how, how do you decide um, how much gel foam, how much liquid to use? Oh, um, the gel foam. Let me go back here, and I'll show you the little gel foam patty. The gel foam patty that we get, and I think it comes for different places, different um, amounts. But what we get is this guy that's not too big, a, a gel foam. It's maybe a centimeter and a half across and four or five centimeters long, fold it over, and then just cut it like a um, matchbook longitudinally and then um, across if you want really uniform um, pieces. And you kind of cut it with the size that you want. Sometimes I want it to be like powdered sugar and other times I want it to be really chunky. So just depending on the size, if somebody's really clamped down, you don't want a bunch of chunks because then it's not going to penetrate well. So you cut it really fine if you've got clamped down vasoconstricted vessels. If it's like big vessels, pretty chunky, you can also throw it in the back of a syringe, like, or a, yeah, maybe a 10 or 20 cc syringe with a three-way and run it through the three-way stopcock between two syringes and just macerate it that, well, that way in some contrast. That's a really fast way to do it if you don't need it to be too fine and if you um, are really in a super, super hurry. And usually it's, um, I, I use pretty much full contrast, and probably this amount of gel foam would be suspended in 20 or 30 um, ml of contrast, just depending on how much like pudding you want it. Sometimes you want it to be like pudding. Other times you want it to be really thin to penetrate. So. It really depends on, on how deeply you want to penetrate and how thick and how quick you want your embolization to be. Does that make Thank sense? You. Thank you for that. I believe it does. No problem. Uh, another question in, uh, that came up was uh, with regards to patients with GI bleeding, uh, patients uh -huh. who are on TPA or heparin for, for other reasons. Um, have, what has been your experience with with uh, treating those given the, the rich network of collateral flow? For GI bleed? Yes. It depends on or the um, origin of the bleed. If um, it's in the duodenum or the left gastric territory, you don't even have to necessarily see it. You can treat empirically. If it's in the SMA or the IMA territory, you need to see it to treat it. And you have to treat it super subselectively to treat safely. Um, overall, I think the uh, if you see it and can identify it, you can successfully treat it if it's a focal bleed. Occasionally, you're going to get a patient who's got um, bad ulcerations, um, in more than one location and you see more than one hemorrhage and it may be too extensive of a network to safely treat um, percutaneously. But if you see a focal bleed, usually you can um, get a microcatheter out to it and um, the success rate is good for treating these. Now, do you have do you have an algorithm in the case where um, a GI bleeding patient is referred to you and uh, you do the angiogram and you don't see a bleeder? Do you have an algorithm uh, as far as uh, giving TPA to uh, expose a bleed that may have temporarily? Yeah. So this is what we usually do. We do a one negative angiogram without a provocative maneuver because there's always a lucky chance that they've stopped bleeding and that's it. But if you don't see anything and they bleed again, 
then a um, couple ways to go. If it's a really brisk bleed and you feel like they're actively bleeding, you bring them back to the angio lab. If it's one of those slow, oozy things where they drop the unit over 24 hours and they may or may not be bleeding at a rate that's visible on angiography, we'd send them to get a tagged red cell scan. If it's a brisk bleed with a fairly precipitous drop, then we bring them back. If you don't see a bleed on the second time and it's like daylight hours, you <laughs> would do um, a provocative maneuver. Start with two um, milligrams of TPA in the vessel that you suspect the most, which is going to be usually either the SMA or the um, IMA, and uh, wait 10 minutes redo the angiogram. If you don't see anything, give them four milligrams of TPA. And if you don't see anything, then you're done. If you see something, then you embolize it. We usually don't do this in the middle of the night when there's like no support, no surgical backup, because if you get somebody bleeding, and like we were talking about earlier, if it's in an area that you really can't safely embolize and you've started somebody to bleed in the middle of the night, it's not a wise situation. So we usually don't do provocative maneuvers unless it's, you know, there's the proper surgical colleagues to, to support you if there is a, a hemorrhage that you elicit and then you aren't able to treat it. So that's what we usually do. Thank you for sharing your uh, your experience there. Uh, one additional question that I had uh, to your last conclusion, uh, as far as working together with uh, surgical trauma colleagues, um, how do you at USC um, get involved in a trauma patient? Is it based on consultation, or um, are you as the interventional radiologist part of the evaluation process at the time of imaging and and how do you see interventional radiologists becoming uh, more integrated in the decision-making process in taking a patient? What happens to... usually, um, and, and there's no possible way for us to evaluate every CT scan that's done on a trauma patient. So, you know, we really aren't um, the initial people to interact with the, the trauma surgeons. It's usually our imaging colleagues who are the first. But um, if they see active extravasation, then they call us and we talk about the patient's clinical situation and where the injury is. And often it's like a very short conversation. Here's the bleed and, we're, and our response is, okay, we'll be there. It, it doesn't you know, usually take an extensive consultation in a trauma patient to figure out what you need to do. It's a pretty short conversation often. There are those that are a little, you know, there's gray zones. Patient who's got active extravasation from his pelvis, hasn't had a blood transfusion, has a blood pressure of 120 over 80, and is a 19-year-old boy. Do you want to, you know, necessarily be doing a pelvic angiogram on him or a young woman? Same thing. Do you want to be doing a pelvic angiogram on a perfectly stable patient, not requiring blood, who you see a small amount of extravasation on those patients? There is some discussion on those, and, and you just decide what's appropriate and what's not. So it, it consultation is usually at the point where a um, therapeutic intervention would be a possibility in the patient. It's not really at the point of imaging. Thank you. And we have one last question here um, okay. with regards to splenic uh, trauma patients and yep. uh, uh, what your experience has been with uh, whether you've seen uh, a decrease in the failure rate of uh, non-operative management uh, when, when the interventional radiologist uh, intervenes? The um, splenic embolization, 
for in those two articles studied yes. a large group of patients. In our ex institution, we're just now getting to the point where we're more um, consistently doing splenic artery embolization in these cases. Our algorithm here has been different than it was in these um, two articles. It, they're modifying, the trauma surgeons are modifying it somewhat, and we're doing more splenic embolization now, I think, than we've done in the past. And uh, I think it has definitely helped, although um, I can't really give you specific facts and figures for us for this institution, but I think those two articles that I talked about are pretty good, and they're um, something that I think most good trauma programs should probably model their algorithms after. Well, thank you. Is that thank it? you again. You're and welcome. There are no additional questions. Um, thank you very much for your time. And uh, you're very welcome. Time. And I'm going to sign off now. Thank you for the invitation. It's been very fun. Thank you so much. Uh huh. Bye bye.